Hey, everybody. Welcome back to night eight. I can't even believe it. Um, it feels like just eight days ago that we started all of this. Um, we are super happy to have you here tonight and we are ready to go. We are talking about unit two and Mr. Jost is all set up and ready. Um, and he's going to be really, really excited if you guys ask a lot of questions in the chat tonight because he wants to answer them so badly. Um, so we are ready to give you all the US history content. Um, that you need today and to get ready, get you ready for the test, which is Friday. In case you didn't know that, I really do hope that you guys know that. But um, it is just a few days away. We want to thank Mr. Jose. He's going to be our content expert, giving us all the information we need. And then we also want to give a big thanks to the Bill of Rights Institute, who made this all possible for us. They, um, they, I don't remember what I was going to say, but they made it all possible for us. And so we thank them for that too. Um, if you want to watch the videos, go back and watch the prior videos. They are all on the BRI YouTube channel. So you can go back and check those out. There is also a lot of APUSH review content that you can find on BillOfRightsInstitute.org. Just type in the search bar AP, APUSH review, and a lot of information will come up there too. So um, without further ado, let's get on to unit too. Oh, that rhymed. Did you hear that? Like, that did rhyme. Yes. You got bars. I, I mean, you know, all right. It's all you. Take it away. Whoa, that's like some crazy, like <laughs> you just freestyled or something. I don't I'm gonna need know. you to follow. I'm gonna need you yeah, to do it. Too. That, I can't even go on. We should just drop the mic and we should go home. Like <laughs> AP exam over. Done. Yes. <laughs> Let's Unit do it. two. Here it is. Welcome, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Are you all appreciating your teachers? I hope you are. I know my students appreciate me every day. Being forced to say that, y'all, against my will. Please send help. But anyways, my name is Mr. Joseph. You are just joining us for the first time today. I've been teaching AP U.S. History for 17 years out here in Los Angeles. And we are going to do our best today to get you ready for Unit 2. We're rocking 1607 to 1754. And I'm going to come back and talk about what we're going to talk about because I don't have a fun fact today. I'm like factless. There's nothing more you need to know about me. So if you had any burning questions in the minds of you wonderful folks, you can go ahead and just put them in the chat. Keep it appropriate, of course. I may or may not decide to answer your question, depending upon the nature of the question. But if there are some good uh, questions, I'd love to hear them. Anything you want to know about Mr. Jones. So today, boys and girls, we're taking a look at 1754, and we're going all the way back to 1607. We actually started our last session looking at the event that happened in 1754, the French and Indian War, but today this unit, Unit 2, starts in 1607. And let's see who's paying attention. Does anybody know why 1607 is the year the College Board has chosen for Unit 2? And if you were about to type the settlement of Jamestown, you are correct. This unit is very much about colonization, the development of colonies in North America. Um, and so this is going to be the story of how the French, the British, the Spanish, the Dutch tried to colonize North America. That's really what Pedem period two is all about. Really quickly to answer the questions in the chat. I did not know I wanted to be a social studies teacher until my first year of college. And that's when I decided this is the path for me. So um, I did choose to do it. Sometimes teachers end up in it. This was my choice. Sometimes students get sad when they hear that. You want it to be a history teacher? Yes, boys and girls, I did. Favorite TV show? Depends on my mood. And right now I'm on Breaking Bad, a rewatch, and The Office. About six months ago, I was on Parks and Rec. So I, I switch it up depending upon what I'm in the mood to do. Do I like snakes? They're cool. I don't want to own one, but they're cool. If I see them in the wild, I'll take a lot of pictures of them. Anyways. That's enough about me. Let's get back to period two. Thanks for asking some questions. Maybe I'll do this again tomorrow. So here's the deal. Period two is really about colonization. And before we really dive in, I wanted to kind of tell you, you could see the evidence of colonization all around you. Um, in my particular neck of the woods, California, uh, also in Tracy's, there is Florida. 
There is a lot of places with Spanish place names, you know, Los Angeles, San Diego, those places, Santa Barbara. Um, and there are examples of Spanish colonization still left over. There are French place names throughout this country because the French also colonized. There are Dutch place names. The Dutch play a role in colonization. And if you go to New York, there are certain names that are derived from Dutch phrases. And then of course, there are a lot of British place names. One thing that I forgot not really to mention, actually, I did not forget to mention, but I'll mention now, is there are a huge number of Native American names or names of places, states, cities, geographic features that got their name from a Native American origin, which connects us to what we're going to be doing tomorrow, which is looking at period one, pre-contact and early colonization. When we're talking about period two, there's a couple of things I want to kind of frame for you. So I'm going to give you some some big picture items, think about it as contextualizing period two. And then what we're gonna do after that is kind of take a look at some of the different colonies that existed and just kind of familiarize yourself or remind yourself of who's where and why they're there. We're not gonna get into all the details, but we're gonna get into the big picture. So remember the Spanish are the first one, of course, to really start to colonize uh, the Western hemisphere. They're the ones who are riding for Christopher Columbus. And when it comes to early North America, we're talking about uh, these particular parts of the United States. This is the area that is gonna be colonized by what is, at the time, uh, New Spain. Um, another thing to keep in mind, I know that this was mentioned in the ch chat, is St. Augustine, Florida is going to be the oldest permanent colony in what is today the United States. So when you think about colonization, you oftentimes think about Jamestown because you know the movie Pocahontas or the pilgrims over in the New England colonies, but actually the first ones in what will be America will be Spain and the Spanish. Remember this particular region is New Spain. And when it came to the importance of New Spain, Remember, Spain's main money makers were the Caribbean, particularly Cuba, parts of Mexico. Remember, they conquered the Aztecs and down into South America. That's where the wealth was coming from. So when it came to colonization of this area, this kind of northern part of their colony, it wasn't very much a priority for settlers to go there. And so primarily what you get is predominantly the mission system developing in our particular part of the uh, country. Um, and, and so lots of Spanish missions were there and uh, this was a part of the Spanish colonization of this particular area. And so from 1565, which is the foundation of St. Augustine to 1607, we're talking about pretty much only the Spanish in what is today North America. Of course, all of that changes in 1607, because in 1607, you have something happening, and that is the first permanent British settlement in North America is established at Jamestown in the Chesapeake region. Now, remember, this ain't the first attempt to colonize. Anyone remember the name of the lost colony, the one that they established? They, like, had people there, and then, like, you know, when people came back, they were like, no sign of them. And there's all sorts of theories about what really went down. Did they become zombies? Did the Native Americans kill them? Did they, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions here. Does anyone know the name of that one? If you do it in the chat, I'm gonna give, oh, look at that. Oh, Bill of Rights Institute. Ooh, fire. Now here's the thing to keep in mind. Each, and this is a very important big idea. If you're getting a, a exam question, and it's about period two, there's a good chance it might ask you to be, compare and contrast the different colonies uh, that emerge as a result of these colonization efforts. And what you need to keep in mind is each of the 13 colonies will have its own unique set of circumstances, like what's gonna happen once they are established, modus for colonization. So like who's going to this particular region, the reasons they're going are oftentimes different and the people who choose to come. And so what you're gonna see is each of these three uh, regions, or really it's four, but for the sake of 
um, keep it in simpler. This is the Southern colony. Sometimes they kind of do, uh, divide the South into the lower Southern colonies and the Chesapeake colonies, but for the most part, the Southern colonies, the middle colonies here in this kind of purplish salmon color, and then the New England colonies here in the orangish color. And so what we have is um, a variety of colonies developing. And we saw yesterday, there is not a unity between these colonies until the period after the French and Indian War. I wanna make sure you understand the kind of key things. These are all things in the key concepts. And I've seen so often students get confused when we talk about Chesapeake, what are we talking about? When we talk about the New England colonies, what are we talking about? Let me break it down for you. So the Chesapeake colony is what talking about Virginia, which is Jamestown, which will eventually be kind of known as the colony of Virginia. It's also gonna include Maryland, Maryland um, as well. That's the first established one. But remember it, the next year in 1608, just to kind of give you kind of a, a timeline of this stuff, you have the colony of New France being established in what is Quebec. The father of New France will be this individual, Samuel de Champlain. He is kind of their, you know, OG founding father of sorts of the colony, similar to John Smith's role. And so if you happen to kind of be comparing these two colonies, what's similar between the two of them? Does anyone remember, like, what is similar between what the French are doing there in Quebec and what the British are doing over in Jamestown? What's the goal or purpose of those particular colonies? And remember, when we're talking about France, eventually, we all know how the story will end with the 13 colonies. But when we're talking about France, eventually, they're going to build this kind of empire in North America, what is today the eastern part of Canada down through the interior along the Mississippi River, that's all going to be part of New France. And they're going to establish forts, you can see some of the significant ones. Fort Detroit, Fort St. Louis. So back to those names that still give us a history lesson when we kind of say them. The French are there primarily for the fur trade. They're primarily there for economic opportunities. Very similarly, the people that are going to the Jamestown colony, they're going there to make money, whether that be gold, silver, which they're not going to really find, but will make them money is tobacco. So that's kind of the early period of colonization. You got the Quebec, you got this, but don't forget about, we also have the New England colonies. And when we talk about the New England colonies, the first one we're really kind of referring to is the Plymouth colony, you know, the pilgrims. And then you get, of course, the old little story about Thanksgiving, but shortly after that, you also have the middle colonies emerging, New Amsterdam. And when we talk about New Amsterdam, just to kind of give you a perspective, all these things are happy, happening very much in the same time period. So the middle colonies are established, the most famous one being New Amsterdam in 1624. So in 1620, you got the pilgrims going to Plymouth. In 1624, you have the Dutch establishing New Amsterdam. In 1607, you have Jamestown. 1608, you have Quebec. All of these different European uh, powers are descending upon this particular uh, region. When we talk about the middle colonies in New Amsterdam in particular, keep in mind, even if you go to New York today and you're gonna look at their state seal um, on government buildings or other official monuments and whatnot, you will see evidence of not only the Dutch history in the state seal, you got the date of establishment of New York City. You also see the history of the beavers which were a big part, the Dutch, like the French, relied on a very friendly or at least cooperative relationship with Native Americans. So rather than just kill them, take their land, which was often the case with the British colonies, the French and the Dutch are going to be trying to develop trade relationships. You give us the beavers, and we, of course, will give you different goods that you are interested in. Yeah, we don't talk about the turkey incident. Please stop talking about the turkey incident. That, that we don't speak about that. That and Bruno, we don't talk about, okay? So look at these kind of situations that are emerging. Like I said, in New France and New Amsterdam, colonists were primarily motivated by economic motives. They're there to make that money. 
When it comes to this particular money pursuit, both the French, and this is in the key concept, so something that you're expected to know, both the French and the Dutch relied on that trade network with local indigenous people. And just to make a connection to last night's session, thank you for those of you who joined us, there was, remember early on, the French had the advantage in that they had the alliances uh, of many, not all, but many of the Native American tribes. And that's not just a sudden thing that happens. That's based on this long relationship of trade amongst French colonists and Native people. And so keep that in mind. So there is the beavers that they are a selling. You know, sometimes I see a beaver and I'm like, that is a cute animal. And then other times he looks like he is up to some shadiness. And that other one, he just looks kind of funny. Like he, I, I don't know, beavers just make me giggle. Now, here's another key thing that you might see maybe as a difference between the different colonies. I've seen lots of SAQs kind of comparing and contrasting colonies amongst the British colonies, you know, comparing the New England versus the Chesapeake, but also can you compare what was similar between the French and the Spanish or the British or the French? Well, take a look at population. Um, one of the things that you will notice is uh, we had some students today in my class, uh, two in particular, say, hey, sometimes I have a little bit trouble kind of understanding uh, different graphics, images. So talking about like this, what is this map showing this? Well, this is 1700. If I'm trying to place that into some context, that's way before that 1754 period. And you should know the dates that are the, the key concept dates. So like I said, period two is 1607 to 1754. So you should remember 1754 is, oh yeah, start of the French and Indian War because it's the end of period two and it's the start of period three. So this is well before the French and Indian War. There's still 50 something years before the war is going to go down. And this is obviously a bit after 1607, which is the start of period two, which is also the foundation of Jamestown. So what you're going to be able to then see is this is kind of in the midway point. And looking at this map, it looks like the French are dominating the colonial struggle. Like they got a ton of land. If we're just looking at North America, they look to be winning. In contrast, the British look to be kind of rather unimpressive. They got this territory along the eastern seaboard. Big deal. But if you look at the population, which is what this map is meant to show us, not just how much land they had, but how many people populated that land, you will see that the British colonies in 1700 had 250,000 people. But the French colonies, which are substantially bigger, only have 15,000. And so there is a difference in not only who comes and why they come, but also in just what happens once they're there. And for the French, remember, their main purpose of the colonies was to generate income, and they're not doing it through cash crops, big farms, plantations. They're doing it through trades with local Native people. Similarly, if you look at the French situation, it's quite distinct in that it occupies a vast part of the interior, whereas the British are confined largely to the East Coast. So you want to kind of be able to kind of articulate what is a map showing you and what does that help you in terms of understanding or proving about history. So just keep those things in mind. Now, a very important topic that I do recommend you spend some time studying, and we'll do a little bit review right now is the regions of the British colonies. Most people just kind of assume the 13 colonies were all established by, you know, Mother Great Britain. They all were the same or similar to one another. They had names, obviously, that were different, but that there was this sense of a colonial identity, that they saw themselves as a unified group. And that wasn't really the case. Like I mentioned, when we talk about the Chesapeake, we're talking about the OGs to the colonial uh, struggle, 1607, Jamestown, the, the original colonization. And then over time, they begin to settle more and more of this particular region, which is named after there is the Chesapeake Bay. And Maryland is right there. And remember, when we talk about Maryland, its original purpose, does anyone remember original purpose of Maryland? 
Maryland, 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 Maryland. What's the purpose of it? Hmm, was it money? Was it, was it money? Was it, was it, was it, was it cash? Was it religion? Were they Buddhist? Was they Muslim, Christian, Catholic, Protestant? Anyone remember? Maryland was, yeah, it was meant to be a haven for Catholics. But remember what happened in Maryland way, way, very quickly, way less people, um, way less, fewer Catholics actually went to Maryland. So yeah, it was meant to establish religious freedom, or at least for Christians. And so yes, it's religious freedom, but different. Once again, think about what's the difference between the Chesapeake and the New England colonies. You could argue that they had a similarity in that in original colonization motives for Maryland and New England were both motivated by this idea of religious freedom. You can also argue they're different in that one was primarily meant to be a Protestant place of religious freedom. Maryland was intended to protect Catholics, but did open up religious freedom to all different Christian groups. So keep those things in mind. Like when you get an SAQ, what do you know about it? What do you know about the Chesapeake and how could you use that to answer a question? So once again, Chesapeake region is Virginia and Maryland right there on the map. Make sure you know that. Their economic motives, when we talk about Jamestown, when we talk about Maryland, it's religious motives, but very quickly it turns to economics because guess what? In Maryland, they can also grow that tobacco pretty good. Not as good in, as in Virginia, but good enough. And when we talk about this particular region, and I'll just kind of, for simplicity pur purposes, Virginia is part of the Southern colonies. We are dealing with an economic system primarily driven by cash crops. So what you're gonna see is economic differences between these particular regions. And I do wanna remind you, notice a, a, a theme or a th common thread running through this. During our period four discussion, we talked about debates over tariffs, manufacturing versus the South. So this stuff kind of does very much these themes, these common uh, historical trends, you'll see as you're studying and hopefully you can start making connections between the different chapters or uh, periods of American history. Um, cash crops is the mind concern, but once again, that we're, we're talking about, it depends on which one you're talking, uh, what particular colony you're talking about. So in Virginia, the cash crop was tobacco. And in South Carolina, the major cash crop was rice. What is important about both of these is this, another difference. And a big difference is remember in the Spanish colonies, we saw the development of something called the encomienda system. And remember the encomienda system in the colonies was very much a form, and many would call it even just slavery, but it had different purposes, not only to control the indigenous people, to ensure a stable labor supply for the various things the Spanish colonies were doing, but also sought to convert them to Catholicism as well. Um, so in Spanish colonies, it was the encomienda system early on. In the French, remember their labor or their economic activity was largely based on trade. So it did not require this intense labor like mining or farming does. In early colonial America, does anyone remember who do they turn to for labor? Like who's gonna like, you know, help want it, who are they going to? And what they go to early on is there's this transition that happens. It's not right away uh, that slavery will kind of take root in America uh, in the way that we oftentimes think about it. It is going to be early on indentured servants. At first, the labor shortage will be filled by white indentured servants from Europe. Uh, and this is largely people who were hoping to make a better life for themselves. They're hoping for some upward social mobility. And in exchange for getting a boat ride to this Western hemisphere, they would agree to work for a period of time around four to seven years. But don't forget, although it's not enslaved people that are doing most of the labor early on, the first enslaved people are brought to Virginia in 1619. And one of the things you're gonna need to kind of read up on 
And, and oftentimes I know in my own class, I don't do a good job of explaining this because of so many other things is how this kind of labor uh, need was being met by the colonies at first, largely through indentured servants, also with people forcibly enslaved through uh, the middle passage. But over time, and especially, does anyone remember the big event that kind of marks a big turning point in, okay, maybe the indentured servants aren't the best source of labor. Maybe there's another group of people that we can not actually let them choose whether or not they're going to be uh, working these cotton or not cotton at this point, tobacco or rice plantations. It's going to be Bacon's Rebellion. And Bacon's Rebellion, which happens in 1676 in the colony of Virginia and in Jamestown, you're going to see this rebellion and you're going to see a accelerated shift towards African enslaved labor as the primary labor source of not only Virginia, but throughout much of the southern colonies. Now, something that's extremely important. There's like a trick question. I'm going to show you some multiple choice questions tonight. You know, one thing people oftentimes fail to understand is slavery was something that was in all of the 13 colonies. It was embedded in all of the 13 colonies, but it was much more prevalent and much, the labor source was much more dependent. They were much more dependent on a slave, enslaved labor source in the South. I agree, bacon's good. Um, when we talk about the New England region, just a couple of things to point out that I've seen students struggle with is this is this area up here in the north. Think of the Puritans. Think of the kind of religious motives for colonization. Remember, they came here primarily because they were seeking religious freedom. They were fleeing this kind of religious conflict that was uh, going on over in Europe. But remember, nothing in history is simple. So although they're fleeing kind of their own religious persecution in their minds, they are not opening up freedom of religion in the New England colonies. That's not what's happening here. But they are very much trying to create, as they said, this city upon a hill. We start with Plymouth in 1620 over here, right near uh, what is today Boston and Cape Cod and whatnot. Then you have the Mayflower Compact. Remember, on the Mayflower, they not only are devising what kind of society they're going to create, they're creating this whole society based upon the vision of God. It's families that are coming, whereas in Jamestown, it was a mix of mainly uh, men. Uh, and so this is a big kind of difference between the Chesapeake in terms of motives for colonization. The Puritans are led by Jonathan Winthrop. He is the one that's going to kind of talk about that city upon a hill plan, that idea of creating this model society. And as is the case often when we talk about colonization, it is going to be joint stock companies like the Massachusetts Bay Company that is going to help fund the expedition. And we have in this particular colony, New England small towns and family farms kind of being the, the norm. So whereas in the Virginia colony, the Jamestown, Chesapeake, and so on, you're going to have mainly plantations and large farms. Here, it's going to be much different in terms of small towns and small family farms. You also have shipbuilding and things like this. So these economies are developing differently. The reasons they're forming are developing differently. And then, of course, you also have the middle colonies. And when we talk about period two, you know, one great example of the middle colonies, and we saw a document from this group yesterday, the Quakers. Remember, William Penn was a Quaker, and he established and wants to establish Pennsylvania, named after him, um, to create a colony of religious toleration. Um, and, you know, unlike some of the other colonies where they were talking about religious freedom, uh, Pennsylvania truly did allow a great degree of religious tolerance, especially uh, at that time. And so in Pennsylvania, you get all sorts of diversity coming in, all sorts of different, not only religions, but also ethnic groups. You got Brits, you got Germans, you got Scots Irish, you got a whole bunch of people going to somewhere like Pennsylvania. And then when we talk about New York, remember New York at one point was colonized by New Amsterdam, uh, the Dutch. And then eventually the British will take over and call it New York. And when we talk about the colonies, and what they're doing to make money, 
in the middle colonies, it is referred to as the bread basket colonies because they're growing wheat, grain, things like that. Which brings me to my question for you all. One question just to kind of, we're at our halfway point. What is your, I didn't get all the cereals. I was going for the old school cereals of my day. So you guys probably have like new, like fancy cereals, but like, what's the best cereal in the world? And I'll answer it while you're typing. Like for me, like my mom would only let us eat like the healthy stuff or the semi-healthy stuff. So I, uh, my, my jam was grape nuts right there. But like, if I was going to get that sugary stuff that my mom never would get me, like I'd go to the friend's house and it'd be cereal day for breakfast. Cocoa Pebbles was the bomb. I love me some Cocoa Pebbles. So anyways, in the chat, Lucky Charms, Reese's Puffs, Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Okay. Yeah, Reese's Puffs are cool too. I like them because that's my jam. I've never been a Captain Crunch fan. This is the British colonies. Um, you will see three regions, very distinct from one another. Um, that is important to kind of keep in mind. It's a very big part of period two. And it's important you know, as I mentioned, that distinct regional differences, New England region, the middle region, the Southern region, between the colonies reflected environmental, so it's freezing cold up here. So obviously they're not gonna be growing things all year. It's nice and sunny over here. So they're gonna have a lot more success growing things. Environmental, cultural, demographic. I don't know why cultural is in there twice, my bad. Cultural and demographic factors. So who are the people going there? What are their values, their beliefs? That plays a role in why these areas are developing differently than one another. So one more time, cash crops, exports to England and slavery, southern colonies. Don't forget about the British West Indies. That is in the key concepts. And even myself, I forget to mention these particular parts of the British Empire. For whatever reason, you need to know this too on top of everything else. But just like the southern colonies, the British West Indies, places like Jamaica, Barbados, that was primarily cash crops reliant on enslaved labor, whether it, whether it be sugarcane in the West Indies or rice in South Carolina, it's gonna be a slave-based economy as you could see in these two images. However, one important thing that kind of governs this time period is this idea, we saw this yesterday, from 1607 to 1763, these colonies were largely allowed to develop free of British control. It was this period of solitary neglect. And so there were moments where the, the colonies were kind of, you know, forced to kind of tighten up their behavior or things like that. For the most part, it was a period of solitary neglect. And I'm just going to say really quickly, I saw it in the corner of my eye, Wheaties. Yes, I love Wheaties. I'd always feel bad about myself because I'd be eating it all out of shape and there'd always be some heroic sports figure like Michael Jordan or whoever. And I'm like, if they eat this and they look like that, I used to buy all the marketing. Like I just believed it. Like, Why Wheaties are you failing me? Anyways, Wheaties are good. Um, and I just want to point out it's far. Like if you go from Jamestown, which the closest airport, I was just, I was like, how long would it take me to get to London? fastest nine hours and 45 minutes so imagine how long it took back in the 1700s and you ain't got airplanes so it took a long time so therefore governing these regions or this region is going to be extremely extremely difficult all right for the sake of time i want to stop for a quick q a is there anything about any of that that makes no sense any questions you have from period two that i can help with i want to make sure you're feeling okay so in the chat, just to let me know that you're alive, you could say no questions or you could type a question and I'll be happy to assist. Eight months, I don't know what that means, but I hope something happens. Whoa, I hope it's not like eight months. That's awfully close to nine months. Is that how long we've been A-pushing? Any Q questions, questions, questions? Sometimes I think that you can unmute your mic and talk to me, but then I realize you can't. That would be awesome. So while you're thinking, I'm gonna queue up kind of our, 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 our next phase of this. Um, and thank you for posting no questions uh, so that I know that you're listening on the other end. 
Um, I'm going to skip some short answers for a moment because I want to take a few moments to kind of look at the multiple choice section. And I'm going to do this today and tomorrow because multiple choice is 40% of your score. And for a lot of students, it's the part where they kind of cruise control it a little bit. And the reason why is you don't have to actually um, sit there and write out anything. You can just kind of like bubble in A, B, C. So like, even if you want to kind of like take a little mental break, it's the first thing you do. It's, it's very easy to not really think about your answers because you're not having to write them out. And so I want to kind of like caution you when you get to the multiple choice section, which is the first part, once again, uh, that you don't make careless mistakes and you really think about some strategies to help you with the multiple choice section. Uh, yeah, you know, for, for, for trying to retain it, the human mind is so fascinating to me, just the way people remember things and the way people make things kind of connect at all is very personal. So it's, it's hard to say uh, how to get people to remember it, except to just kind of go over it in different ways. And so, um, yeah, I just, you got to see what works. Some people are really good at taking super long Cornell notes. Other people are like, I need some graphic organizers. Some people need to watch a video. Some people can learn it all from just reading the book. Some people can stand next to someone who knows it on a bus and they retain all the knowledge that way. It's, it's crazy. So I, I don't know. I wish I did. But I want to take a look at a few multiple choice questions and, um, and kind of give you a little piece of feedback about just careless mistakes that you don't want to make and also some strategies that if you're having some trouble that you can turn to in the event that you need some help because 55 minutes, uh, 55 questions, that's, that's, it's a lot. So we're going to start with kind of an easy one, um, at least easy-ish in that it's not some dense text. Uh, but um, if we take a look at it, let me just kind of, I'm going to read it to you, which I hate doing, but I want you to kind of hear my thought process once again. So there's different people who have different thoughts about, do you read the source first or do you read the question first? I can't answer that for you as individuals. For me, um, I typically read the source really quickly, uh, whereas other people find no benefit of that. So I'm going to just kind of do it the way I do it when I do these practice tests. So this is the number of Africans transported to the new world. So the number of people of uh, African people forced against their will to come to the new world, 1450 to 1900. That's a long time, but okay. Um, and then we got numbers of millions. And then here is the question. The pattern depicted on the graph from 1450 to 1800 best serves as evidence of which of the following. All right, the number of Africans. And so then I kind of take a look, the replacement of indigenous labor and indentured servitude by enslaved Africans in new world colonies. Okay, yeah, I was a little confused. We, I don't think we did this one. I think it was a different one, but yeah, they all start to look alike. Um, so the replacement of indigenous labor and indentured servitude. So this is kind of implying that indigenous people, native people and indentured servants were replaced by people enslaved from Africa. So would that be a explanation that would show this increase? Because it says by 1800. So we're stopping our analysis right here, 1800. It is going up pretty substantially. So was it because indigenous labor and indentured servants were no longer being used and they started to force uh, enslaved Africans. Well, that sounds like a good possibility, but you definitely wanna re read all the options. The development of varied systems of racial categorization in the European colonies. That sounds really good too, because I do know that in the colonies, there was different racial categorizations. In the Spanish colony, they had all sorts of different kind of groups you know, that were the result of Europeans and native and African people kind of mixing. And so, you know, then there was this kind of caste system where there were certain groups that were valued higher up within that hierarchy of race. So the development of varied systems of racial categorization in the European colonies, that seems like it could be a good solid answer too. So I'm not going to cross that one off yet, but A and B both look good to me. C, the effectiveness of the abolitionist movement in Europe and the Americas. Well, 
if it's going up, I don't think they're really effective because like abolition is to end slavery and it's going up. So C's garbage. And so you can write in the book, well, mark it off, X, not C is, is trash. The susceptibility of enslaved populations to new world diseases. Now that's definitely a true statement because as we're going to learn tomorrow when we talk about period one one of the by far the biggest killer or reasons for the native population decline was not necessarily wars which happened too but it was disease especially smallpox so that sounds historically correct but this is talking about the number of people africans transported to the new world so what do you all say? I think I actually showed the answer by mistake. A, B, D. I, and if you want, you can put C. Tell me. Someone tell me. What, what are we talking about for this particular question? And while you're kind of putting your letter into the, the chat, one thing I want to point out is almost always there's two answers that seem pretty good. Um, this one's not true because although that's a true statement, this graphic doesn't really kind of show us that. It's just showing us the numbers of people of African descent being put into bondage. So yeah, the answer is in fact uh, A, which you guys are getting. Um, it sees, seems like at least. Um, it is A. Um, remember, as I just mentioned with Bacon's Rebellion, indentured servants, uh, not as many people are kind of volunteering to serve at, as indentured servants. There's also this concern about, okay, what happens when these people are free? They're going to be this lower class uh, group who's going to make demands on the elite what happens if we kind of have another group that's on the bottom of society so yeah a is the the answer to this one it's not a very to per, particularly difficult question but i've seen a lot of students get tripped up by b but that doesn't necessarily explain or serve as evidence for this okay so keep that in mind Let's take a look at a little bit of a more difficult question. And this one is in a set of questions. So we'll get a few practice rounds into looking at a set of questions because some students have trouble with this, right? They, they feel like they have to reread the passage each time. And if you do that, you're gonna run out of time and you don't want to leave any blank. Everyone listen to me. If you're like half watching TV and half listening to this review, do not, let 50 minutes go by and have empty or no responses on some of your uh, test. You have a 25% chance of just guessing. There's only four choices. Don't do that at all. Uh, so if you're running out of time and you need to at least put something down, do that rather than turn in something with some blank answers. So let's take a look at this particular um, um, thanks. So, uh, Denisha, you're saying that's not reflected on the graph. Um, I, are you saying A is not reflected on uh, the, the graph or, or B? Or were you responding to B when I was talking about B? Because you know what? It's, there's a delay. So I see your comment like a minute later. And so then I could be, you know. So let me know what you meant by that if you would like. So take a look at this one. This is the kind that really scared the heck out of students because it's old. And so I'm going to kind of give you uh, my perspective on these questions, show you how I would approach it. And then once again, ask you, what do you all think? So I do read the source. Hugh Jones, don't know him. The present state of Virginia. Okay, 1724. So I'm just guessing. Don't know Hugh, but he is someone who's living during colonial Virginia times. Beyond that, don't know. I read the question first. Some people start reading the source. That's a personal choice. Do a practice test if you can and figure out, do you have enough time doing it the way you do it? And if the answer is yes, do it that way. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, I thought you were talking about B, but I was, I was lost. Thanks for clarifying. So if we take a look here, I'll just go and read the source just because in Virginia, in Virginia, the Negroes live in small cottages called quarters under the direction of an overseer who takes care that they tend such land as the owner allots and orders. 
their greatest hardship consisting in that they and their posterity are not at their own liberty or disposal, but the property of their owners. The children belong to the master of the woman that bears them. Okay, so think about what you're hearing as it's going, making sure you understand it. A lot of students will just race through the source, get to the question, and then realize they don't retain anything, not that you need to memorize it. Remember, you're only looking for the big idea. What is this saying? What is it showing me about history? So you want to make sure you're, you're at least not just going over the words and getting to the end and going, don't know, got to go back and look for the answer. The abundance of the English entertain that they are all fools and beggars that live in any other country but theirs. This home fondness has been very prejudicial to the common sort of English and has in a great measure slowed the plantations from being stocked with such inhabitants as are skillful, industrious, and laborious. These English servants are but an insignificant number when compared with the vast shoals of Negroes who are employed as slaves there to do the hardest and most important part of the work. Now, I'm going to tell you something here really quickly. As I was reading that, someone who went to UCLA to study history, like I enjoy this stuff. While I was reading this, my mind was wandering. And I know once I got to the end of this passage, I did not even retain. I know it's talking about like, England and clearly talking about, well, the term they use, you can obviously see it. They're talking about enslaved people. Um, it, but, but if you were to have me really explain it beyond that, I would struggle. So I am a really poor reader. I don't have really high level skills in that area. So I have to be careful with, you know, maintaining my focus during the exam. Now, if you look at the question, though, you can sometimes kind of then and, and, and find yourself the answer. The labor system described in the first paragraph of the excerpt was most similar to the labor system used for, and then it gives you a bunch of choices. Um, mining in New Spain. So think about what do we know about mining in New Spain? Well, I remember they use indigenous people and also slaves. So, okay, that can maybe do it. Whaling in New England. All right, I don't remember learning much about whaling labor. I know that they, they hunted whales and built boats in the New England colonies, but I imagine it was like, you know, like big old, like hairy dudes, like wearing, you know, sea stuff. Like, so I don't, I don't really know that that would fit this, which is basically saying, basically the overseer who is kind of taking care of this particular region. Y'all going with D? Going D. What makes you say D? I like how you're ahead of me. You see, you're you, this is this this group. You guys are just gonna get five. This is is done. Yeah, the answer is D. Sugar in the Caribbean. And and the reason why it's the answer is probably for the same reason you got right. It's in describing a system in which people are property, and those people are property because of their race. They are brought in, and so therefore the answer is D. Let's see if we can keep running it this way. So here's the second part to this question. The development described in the excerpt represented which of the following long-term trends in Virginia? The hardening of racial divisions, the oversupply of indentured laborers, the dominance of subsistence farming, the Anglicization of colonial culture. Okay, these, all right, all right. What do you guys got for this one? Mm-hmm. Easy. I like the we're going, we're going. I I Ella, are you going D for that last question? I love it. I hope it's for the last one. But the one from like 10 minutes ago. I'll see. So this one we got a little bit of a difference. A C. Got a couple C's on there. Okay. The answer is A, A. So you got to be careful. You got to make sure that you're really kind of critically 
Because think about what it's saying that development described in the excerpt represented which of the following long-term trends in Virginia. Think about the labor source long-term trends in Virginia. What happens over time? And over time, we're talking about the implementation, the increased reliance on enslaved labor forcibly brought from Africa as the primary way that they are going to meet the labor needs. Um, and this particular document is describing how there is a change in that labor system currently going on. Let me kind of, just because of time, get, get us kind of looking at some of the ways that they've asked questions about this period too. Um, and like I said, to start us off, there's a lot of questions about this kind of comparing and contrasting uh, of the uh, different colonial regions. So for instance, uh, this one is basically kind of giving you a broad range, 1607 to 1754 briefly describe one difference between the economy. You gotta be careful because you know they may just give you a category. In this case, they're talking about the economy of British North American colonies in the Chesapeake region, such as Virginia and Maryland, and the economy of the middle colonies, such as Pennsylvania and New York. Now they're being nice here in that they actually tell you which colonies are in those regions. I've seen prompts that don't clarify what that means. And students will write all about the New England region when they're thinking about the Chesapeake. Um, and so if you were to take a look at this, on one hand, you have the uh, implementation of cash crops like um, tobacco, whereas in the middle colony, they tended to be producing grains and wheats and things of that nature. So it was the, 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 the bread basket. Another difference would be there was much more of a reliance and a rigid racial structure in the colonies in the Chesapeake. And although in the middle colonies, slavery did exist, uh, it was not a primary source of the labor in that particular region. Uh, they may ask you to describe one similarity, you know, so a difference and a similarity. And then typically, this is where I've seen students struggle, explain one reason for a difference between the economy of the Chesapeake and the economy of the middle colonies. So you could talk about the Chesapeake had a longer growing season, for instance. Um, that would be an example of why um, there was a difference between cash crops uh, and, and others. Uh, here's another kind of form of the same type of question, but this time kind of comparing European colonies. Briefly explain one important similarity between the goals of the Spanish and the English in establishing colonies in the Americas prior to 1700. So let's see how you would do with this. Think about A, what's a difference or a similarity, my bad, even I'm kind of sometimes misreading the questions. What's a similarity between the goals of Spain and England in establishing colonies in the Americas prior to 1700? All okay, right, let's see. What, let's see if we have any, uh, like, period two experts in the building or in the Zoom, in the YouTube. Okay. I think one similarity you could definitely talk about is the, the, the drive for mercantile goals, right? Looking for economic uh, opportunities, whether that be the, the, the Spanish with the mining, because notice what it says. It says the Americas. It doesn't just say North America. So you want to be careful. Like, are you answering the prompt they're asking you. So both in the Spanish colonies, whether you talk about the Caribbean or you talk in Mexico or Peru or in other parts of Latin America, there are, they are kind of seeking an economic resource, gold, silver, sugarcane, whatever. And that also was the case in some of the English colonies. And you can use the example of, of course, Jamestown uh, and tobacco. So yeah, they're looking for money. I mean, all, everything I just said was basically saying money, but you want to explain it a little bit because it's not enough just to say the answer. You got to say, how does this help me answer the question they've asked? Okay, yeah, the three Gs, which is what I think my cell phone's on, like, because it's really slow. That's a bad, bad history joke. I'm sorry, you deserve better. 
Um, likewise, C tells you, explain one important difference between the goals of the Spanish and English in establishing colonies in the Americas prior to 1700. So then you got to kind of shift your brain. Okay, what's the difference between the two? What difference would you go to? You went gold with the part A. What would do it here? A difference, an important difference between the colonies of the English and the Spanish. And I think I would do uh, a very similar tactic for this one is think about kind of the most obvious answer. And one of the most obvious things to me is if we're looking at the colonies, the British colonies as a whole, when they came for religious purposes, they tended to be Protestant, whereas the Spaniards tended to be Catholic and relied on trying to um, convert native people. Another, so, so just kind of when they, their interpretation of religious freedom was oftentimes kind of dictated by where they came from. The British tended to be kind of uh, in the New England region, for instance, uh, primarily Protestant, um, whereas the Spanish were Catholic. You know, it, sometimes these, these, these answers are a little bit more obvious and sometimes you gotta kind of uh, dig a little deep and think, okay, what, what, what could I use for this particular, anybody have any other uh, good responses for B? You could definitely argue that the, remember what we didn't learn about the English is them actually trying to convert the native people. That wasn't a concern of theirs really at all. Whereas the Spaniards, when they went there, they may not have been there primarily because of God, but when they were there and they were kind of exploring their religious motivations, it often meant that they were trying to convert native people to spread Catholicism. That wasn't the case of the um, British. Okay, got some answers coming in. Different relationships with natives, that would definitely be a uh, solid. But keep in mind what it's saying there for B, that would not work because it's talking about the goals. So what's the difference between the goals? You couldn't say they had different relationships with the natives unless you link that back to what their goals were. So you could argue, if you were to extend your answer, the Spaniards were much more willing to incorporate native people into their society to fulfill labor needs as well as religious needs whereas the British tended to push the native people um, out of territory that they uh, controlled and occupied. So these are just different ways you can approach it um, and you would ultimately get points around uh, those answers for period two. So kind of coming back to our uh, starting point, are there any questions before we head out? And we tackle tomorrow the last one in period one, the last unit. And then on Thursday, we're going to have kind of a big review session and we'll see how that goes. But can I help anybody with anything before we're out of here on this nice Tuesday? All right. Well, Tracy, I'll maybe the while, while, uh, while, while they're typing, you can kind of close this out. And if there's no questions, we'll just say farewell. Okay, well, um, if you know if the lights go out, it's because there's a horrible storm here in Florida right now, all of a sudden out of nowhere, because that's how we roll. Um, but so thank you so much, Daniel, for another amazing night. You have done an impeccable job getting everybody ready. Um, this has been so informative to everybody. Um, so guys, listen up. Mr. Joseph has taken us from current times um, with Unit 9, and he's worked all the way back to Unit 2, 1607, the establishment of Jamestown. And that is a ton of information and we both know that and we recognize it and so do your teachers who have hung out with you every night on these webinars so thank you and shout out to all those teachers and happy teacher appreciation day um, but we know that this is a lot of information and so the whole idea behind all of this and the bill of rights institute even offering this was to simply make sure that you could review everything that you've learned for the last nine months, right? It, I mean, it's been constant, almost 180 days of learning. Um, and so you're ready, but we know that you don't remember the stuff from the beginning. So that the whole idea was just to bring you back. So one more session, um, and we're gonna go over that tomorrow. Um, huge shout out to 
Mr. Jost, thank you so much. And to Bill of Rights Institute for bringing this um, all to us. And the Bill of Rights Institute wants to help you guys. We really would love you to check out our website and see all the different resources that are available to you. Um, down in the resources below linked to this one tonight are specific documents that we go with this time period, whether it's Mayflower Compact or it's um, Winthrop's letters or just a lot of primary sources and things that are relevant to these years. So feel free to check those out. And if you head over to www.billofrightsinstitute.org, there's a number of other things that um, can help you on that site too. So um, let us know if you have any questions. We are here for you. We can't wait to see you tomorrow night. If there are no more questions um, for Daniel and I, we will say good night to everybody. Anything? All right. Well, good night, everybody. Have a great night. Get some rest. Um, you know, go to bed, actually, and enjoy your evening. And we will talk to you again tomorrow at the same time for our last session. Okay. Oh, we're actually we have two more sessions. So we will see you guys tomorrow night. Take care.